And so um, the idea is we say we're trying to understand vision through, uh, 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 through this new framework, but the thing is, where should this new framework start? And we just said encoding kind of pushed to the limit at around V1. Okay, we cannot really understand everything just through information, uh, representation or efficiency and so on. So selection is perhaps starting, but let's see what do we mean by attentional bottleneck and so on and so forth, yeah? Okay, ready? Okay, information bottleneck in the visual pathway. Um, we have 20 images per second coming in and each comes at about 1 million pixels and uh, probably one byte per, per pixel. So that's about 20 books per second. Yeah, we really have no time to read them all. And of course, if you have wait a minute, you know, it's not compressed, you can zip it before you send to the brain. And so therefore it's actually compressed. I mean, how much you can compress JPEG or MPEG, maybe by a factor up to 100. So therefore 20 books to one book, but still huge book we have a download there. And uh, yeah, I start going that way. And uh, you cannot really read the book in one second, uh, not even one page. How much can you read? Roughly one sentence. If it's a long sentence, two sentences, if it's a short sentence. This has been measured in 1950s, and then this is repeated. And it, it's very surprising, but it's actually not too bad. 40 bits per second is rather 10 digit per second. It's not too little, except it's very little compared to one book, okay? But that's how much it is, and that's, you say, really? Let's just demonstrate. Can you tell the difference between these two images? If you have encoded all of these images, none, nothing deleted, you should see the difference right away. Can you see the difference? Some people have <laughs> the difference, yeah? Yes, no, can you see the difference? Raise your hand. Some of you see the difference, some of you still cannot. This is already five seconds past, six seconds, seven seconds, yeah? Okay, the difference is very big, it's not small, yeah? And so this demonstrate that we cannot encode everything, we don't select everything, and we are nearly blind, we are 99% blind, okay? And so people actually measure it by doing this. What they do is they say, okay, I'm gonna tell you, show you these 16 symbols, okay? 16 symbol is four bits of information, and you flash it to you very, very quick, how fast can I flash you? you say, which one of them flash? is there? You say, oh, it's a star you just flashed to me. It's a, how fast do I have to flash until you cannot tell anymore that more or less measure? what is your bottleneck in a fashion single symbol by 115 a second well you know this and that you know this is just primitive experiment that you could do is say ah, capacity roughly larger than this. yeah that's more or less the thing and then people trying to change a version to some other version then they actually true it is that's how much we are blind we are really blind okay so the question is, how do we attend? Okay, we you say if you choose this two sentences out of a whole book to read. I say, ah, how do we attend? Hey, you can ask this question in different ways. How do you direct attention neurally? Yeah, okay, and so on, so forth. Behaviorally and neurally, what's the consequence of directing attention? Okay, behaviorally and neurally. So let's start behaviorally. What do you attend? You do it by shifting your gaze, okay? So imagine you start your gaze here, and then you move there, 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 blah, blah, blah. And that's how you, and so for instance, there's also a top-down versus bottom-up gaze. So for instance, if you're reading a book, your gaze will just go, to, go towards that. And just, just have a test, okay? Imagine you direct your gaze to this letter Q. Look at it, no cheating. Can you read this, this letter N? Uh, can't, yeah? So whatever you do not direct, you can't see, so that's that short. But anyway, you can direct this, and then if suddenly something comes up, you have to immediately shift, otherwise maybe it's a tiger. It's a mosquito, no problem, yeah? And uh, you can also direct this by, by spatial base to say, look here, okay? Somebody can point it to you, look here, or some flash of light make you look there, okay? It's just exogenous. Uh, it can be feature-based. You can say, okay, look for a red cup. That anything red in the image in the world will attract your attention a bit more. Or object-based. So for instance, if you look at a cup and any location on a cup will also enjoy a bit more CPU processing than a location outside cup. It's called object-based attention. So this is how we direct attention. But what are the consequences of attention? What do you mean by attention? Especially people talk about, oh, you know, a bit wishy-washy, isn't it? You know, how can you, is it definable? Is it measurable? So one way to measure it is, is let's say, okay, 
uh, do visual search. So for instance, a search for a vertical bar. Okay, it's very easy to find here, not easy to find here. Well, even worse. So the speed of uh, time it takes for you to find it is a way to measure that this is grabbing your attention. Uh, Okay, uh, you know, for instance, you can you can find a, a vertical bar very easy here. Yeah, can you find a red, vertical red bar here? Difficult, isn't it? It's there. Okay, so somehow this grabs your attention automatically, more automatically than this airplane engine that you did not see. But so what makes it that this one you see? I did not have to tell you, but this one is difficult. This may be like an airplane engine you could not see. Yeah, and uh, here, for example, uh, you know. Um, somehow this vertical bar does not look like grabbing your attention as strongly as this cross. Yeah? How come this cross among bars grabbing you more than the bar among cross? Well, we don't know. Okay. There's an asymmetry in it. You now well, this asymmetry is between some of the brain algorithms that are using it. Yeah. And so these are called feature search. This is psychology experiments. People say feature search that the reaction time to find a bar, you know, a unique one, is independent of the noun targets. That's called efficient search. But these are and uh, these are inefficient search like this. You find a red vertical bar. My goodness, you've talked about red vertical bar. Oh, okay. okay. So it takes longer, and longer the more items you have. This is a psychological operational way to say how strong something grabbed my attention. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, traditionally, you usually think that the basic things that are different will make uh, make us uh, attend to it. So, so the color orientation on motion, these are kind of basic feature dimensions that uh, can afford efficient search. And then, okay, I, I think I'm a little bit um, not very organized in this, but anyway, I try to correct myself as I go around. Yeah. But anyway, neurally, which bit to make you look? So supracliculus is this location. This is monkey's brain open up like a world map sheet open up, divided into different brain area. This is neon cortex. This is under the brain. It's called supracliculus. This is where you can go into the muscle region and move your eyes, okay? So you trace it and see who is sending signal to it. Turns out the frontal eye field, which is in your frontal part of the brain is responsible for it. And somewhere in the middle of the brain, this parietal cortex is sending to it. Interestingly, your V1, okay, your first layer in your CNN is also doing it. It's massive. And this was known for decades, but somehow wasn't quite appreciated until recently, yeah? And uh, so therefore, this is where the bottom up is because object recognition obviously hasn't happened. So somehow you have to read these two sentences in the whole book before you realize what it says, yeah? And so therefore some, and then this is maybe the way your top down is, you know, your gaze is attended to the screen because you have a top down goal of listening to this lecture, yeah? And so, uh, and uh, there have been debate in the psychology community say where is, a selection happening, it is happening early versus late, and it's going on for quite the many decades. The early means that before you recognize, you already deleted. Late means, oh, you did not delete until later. It's just it's not in the memory. By the time you ask us, I, I, I did not store it in memory. Yeah. And so, therefore, this debate, without really going to the how in detail, it can go on forever. And so, therefore, this debate has been going on for a long time. And can we find evidence is actually starting early? or late because it's going to really dictate what will be the visual algorithm depending on evidence favoring early or late yeah that's the idea and so one, one way you can do it in biology is lesion okay you say if somebody you know, had a gun bullet shot or you can do it on animal you know in, in the war sometimes you have these wounds or you in, in old people you have strokes you can if it's a stroke to a localized region so if you're lesion the superior curriculum then the saccades where we move our eyes, the short latency sky disappeared. And if you lesion the frontal eye field, then it's difficult to saccade by demand. Okay, say so move your eye to the right, it's uh, move eye to, to where the light was. That's something memory guy is difficult. But if you lesion both, then the animal cannot do saccades anymore, you cannot direct attention. 
And it uh, turns out that in lower animals, such as fish or birds, the superior cortex plays much bigger role than a higher animal like humans we are, because our neocortex somehow just takes over much more. Now, just imagine you call it neocortex. Neo means new in evolution. So all, uh, this, by the way, V1, V2, and all these are part of neocortex. So these are all evolutionally newer ones in our humans, yeah? And um, it's known traditionally that the superior colliculus, this area, and these are areas that you, before you move your eye to that location, the neurons responsible in responding to that location will fire before you move your eyes to it. So somehow these neurons must be playing some role. But recently it's found that in fact, V1 neurons do that too. Yeah, well, so in a sense that, yes? Retina, yeah, interesting. The retina also goes uh, towards that. Turns out that for lower animals, retina indeed do that a lot. Uh, high animal in humans, you do have this pathway, but you find that if you lesion V1, then the animal cannot move eyes anymore. So that means the retina to that pathway is not enough. Yeah, so. Uh, and people also notice that it's a population coding in the superior calyx. So imagine in the superior calyx, so you have one electrical stimuli in this location, another electrical stimuli location number two. If stimuli location number one, they will make eye movement in this way. And stimuli location two, they are moving in that way. But if you stimulate two locations together, it's like a vector summation. Okay, nice. Okay, however, then they find out that what if you only stimulate location one, you stimulate the electric stimulate location one, however, rather than stimulate location two at the same time, you just flash at this destination for location two, then the eye movement will go a little bit deviate to that. So that means the flashing is equivalent almost to stimulating that location. So there is, yeah, uh, this is people trying to understand, yeah? So you can pay attention by having the neuron active. You can also pay attention by flashing something to grab your attention to it, yeah? Something like that. Okay, and then neuron, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Actually, I was a little bit confused with that, but let's say what's the consequence of attention in neural uh, responses? Because after all, remember, attention means if I look at this way, somehow this information is the 40 bits that enter to my later processing, but that was not, yeah? Where is the signature? Okay, so first of all, let's also say, uh, why am I doing this maybe? Anyway, versus bottom up and top down, um, which one is more important? Okay, uh, and how is it uh, uh, manifest in our, in our life? Imagine you have a goal, just like a goal here is listen to a lecture, but how about goal here is to do a search for a uniquely oriented bar? So your top-down goal is the goal that you are having a task, okay? So the top-down goal will make you pay attention to this bar. However, all of you see that bar, no? It's more than like an airplane engine. So the bottom up somehow make you see that one. Even though you're supposed to look at that one, your gaze will automatically be attracted to that. And then you say, okay, if you want to understand whether V1 is playing a bigger role than that, and which one is more important? This has to save your life. So even if you live through a lecture, a tiger jumps in, you better look at the tiger. So uh, and better notice the tiger, yeah? And so this is, says the idea, at least transiently bottom up may be more important. Another way of saying is because we move our eyes three times a second, you actually move your eyes 180 times a minute. So I'm asking you how many of these eye movements are you aware? One person told me. I move my eye once a minute because I'm a very focused person. <laughs> Another person, I move my eye 10 times a minute, but you move your eye 180 times. So therefore, more than 90% of your eye movement, you are not aware. That means they are completely automatic, uh, dominantly automatic. So bottom up perhaps is very important, yeah? So that gives you a, a kind of an end of an envelope uh, computation uh, estimation of how important is your under the iceberg tip of the iceberg move eye movement okay and then you can ask your question well you say here is one megabytes by the end of the day it's 40 bits per second and enter one megabytes per second where along this pathway the information is lost 
Maybe V1 is still one megabytes. By the time V1 to V2 is a half a megabytes or 0 0.1 megabytes, that's the empirical question we need to answer, yeah? But nevertheless, just by asking this question to start with, we are already orienting ourselves to a different framework of research. That makes sense, yeah? Saccades, yeah? Jittering is not counted. You have to be moved big enough, uh, at least about half a degree or more. Yeah. We actually jitter 60 hertz, so that's not counted. We jitter anyway. 60 hertz is not 60 times per second, no? We only move three times a second, so jitter doesn't count. Yes. Uh, can you just quickly, um, how are we defining the tension problem? Okay, we define attention. Yeah, this is why I feel like I maybe lost some. I, this is this is why I apologized, but I tried to skip it. So we define attention. This bit I somehow put in the wrong slides. The consequence of a directing attention. Yeah, somehow I lost some slides. Yeah, thank you for catching me on this. It's important because otherwise it become hand wavy. Okay. Okay, so the, here is a, a part. So imagine uh, you have a task, okay? You, you fix it in the middle, okay? And your task is in these four boxes, something will appear. It could appear here, it's always a letter T. Okay, it could appear there, it could be here, it could be here. And your task is to say whether this letter T is right way up or up way upside down, okay? But you, your eye has to fix in the middle. But before it appeared, if this flashed and then it appeared, you will do it better because this flash will attract your attention there. Even though your gaze can be fixed here, your attention can go there, okay? However, if it flashed there, but the T appeared here, or let's say the T actually appeared there, it flashed there, but if it did not flash there, but a flash here, the T appeared here, you will do this task worse so that the, the accuracy, the performance, whether the T appear at the same flash location versus not the same flash location, that performance difference is operational definition of attention. With your gaze fixed. Yeah, that's one thing. So you could do attract attention by flashing. You could also attract attention by having an arrow pointing to that one before it appears. Okay, so if you point that way, the attention go there, the gaze still fix it here, but you appear here then it will cost them. So the cost of directing attention wrongly and directing attention correctly, that is defined as attention, yeah? And in this case, is attention is achieved by not moving your eyes, but it can also be achieved by moving your eye. So in this case, cost is in, in terms of accuracy, yeah, performance, so you know, 90% correct, 80% correct. Another cost is faster. You can do the faster or slow, so reaction time. These are two ways of measuring attention. And this can nail the psychology experiment down without hand waving. So there you go. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, we're at the way, and then, then um, uh, so neurally, how do we direct attention? As I say, it could be bottom up and top down. And so on, and so, yeah. We say maybe bottom up is important. Okay, so with this, I uh, started a, a V1 CDC hypothesis that it starts at V1. So this is a psychological quantity. There is a saliency map somehow built in the brain in a black box. And uh, uh, the visual input, you know, this vertical bar attract our attention, the saliency map in the brain. In the brain. And uh, by putting it into this equation that equal to V1 firing rate is a theoretical hypothesis, then we have to say whether this hypothesis makes sense by experimental testing them. And so the idea is somehow this firing in the brain uh, in V1, this neuron to this bar is firing more, and then this is downloaded into the superior calculus, which is the midbrain area, that reads it and find a winner and direct your gaze to it use your muscle. That's the execution and read out of this. So that's the hypothesis, okay? And so by this hypothesis, 
It turns out that you can say, wait a minute, how does the neuron know that this has to fire more? Uh, is it because the neuron sensitive vertical is more sensitive than horizontal? But what if this is horizontal, the rest of the vertical should also work? So it's not because the neuron is more sensitive vertical. It's because in V1, we have these things called isofeature suppression. It means that this vertical neuron is activate, uh, this vertical bar is activating vertical two neuron, and this these horizontal neurons uh, bars activating horizontal two neuron, and neuron tuned to the same orientation suppress each other. And so therefore, this vertical neuron is not being suppressed by neighboring vertical neurons because neighboring neurons are not activated. How do you know that? Turns out that it was known since 1970s and people just feel what a silly biology and they just ignore it. But it was there. Does that make sense? So that's how it works, okay? So it works. So for instance, I saw features, I saw neuron tuned to the same orientation suppress each other. So the one single one uh, not suppressed. So this is the only one not suppressed. So it's a recurrent neural network in V1 where neuron tuned to same features suppress each other. Okay, that's what happened. And uh, that's, that's the idea. And it turns out it's not all to all. So only neighboring neurons within a distance of three or four millimeters, which is within the distance of a few bars, yeah? That's what happens. And uh, turns out that not only tuned to the same orientation suppress, tuned to the same color also suppress each other, tuned to the same motion direction also suppress each other. V1 has them all. And so therefore, all you need, so at this, remember V1 is an overcompleted representation. So therefore at this location, there may be 1,000 neurons tuned to that location, some tuned to this orientation, some tuned to that orientation, some tuned to that orientation, some tuned to, that orientation, some tuned to red color, some tuned to pink color, some tuned to So they all kind of say, and so, 1,000 neuron, but there's one neuron they're firing most. Who cares? Superior collector, you just count the number, count the firing rate, that's all. So that's a very simple algorithm, isn't it? So that requires over complete representation, okay? So therefore, this is iso orientation suppression, iso color suppression, iso motion direction suppression, and neural activity universal currency bid for attentional selection. Imagine you have an auction shop, which has a slogan that says, attention auction here, no discrimination between your feature preferences, only spikes come. And this auctioneer, maybe the superior critic, says, hey, I don't know whether you are male, female, old, young, professor, students, as long as you give me most money, I give you attention. I give you eye movement, that's all. Does that make sense? So therefore, you can have a V1 neuron tuned to color, V1 neuron tuned to motion direction orientation. They pay with their currency, which is their fine rate spikes. And this currency is read by superior calibus. And uh, if you have an overcomplete representation, that's really, really fast. And that's exactly what you need for bottom up attention selection. That makes sense. Yeah. And so that's the idea. And therefore, you say, OK, can you predict something? So anytime you have a theory, you say, well, this may be explained past things. Can you predict something that we haven't seen before? In biology, lots of things have been measured, psychology. Measured. Is there something you haven't? You can predict that's one way kind of a, to test whether the theory correct. Turns out there's a surprising prediction. Surprising prediction is like this, okay? Imagine you make people do an experiment and you say you have a top-down task. Your task is to find a uniquely oriented bar. Very easy. Okay, this uniquely oriented bar will activate you one cell very heavy because it's iso orientation suppression. Very good. But you make them wear stereo goggles such that you put all these bars in the left eye. No problem, okay? We won't have neurons tuned to the left eye, they will activate, and so that's good. You, you, your, the task is to find this bar and press the button as soon as you find it. Usually half a second we can do it. However, if you, oh, this is a search target and it's, uh, this, uh, they have to do their task for, but if you put one of the non-target bar to the right eye, Okay, they will see exactly the same thing because the visual perception is the left eye and right eye superposed together in their brain by V2, it's like that. Okay, in V1, the neuron tuned to the left eye input, the neuron to the right eye input, but in V2, all neurons are binocular. So therefore by V2, you cannot even decode which eye sees what. In fact, you can ask observer which eye, which bias to a different eye, they cannot answer. They say, I don't know, they all look the same to me. And so therefore, however, remember we have this iso feature suppression, we say, well, turns out that this one, is task irrelevant, but V1 saliency will make it fire very a lot because it has no neighbor suppressing it because neurons tuned to the same eye also suppress each other. So therefore, this one have a higher response. So therefore, we predict that this will attract your attention. That sounds so surprising. Nobody ever done an experiment with it. And if you do experiment, that's indeed the case. Three out of four trials, their gaze go there before it's as if this is something red color, except it's not visible. 
yeah and so therefore this is a very strong fingerprint of v1 because this signal is only available v1 and not available v2 v3 before and beyond and not available to people's awareness and also this is an example of looking before seeing remember we say we have a huge book to read we have to get two sentences where we need to pay attention to how do you know if i already read the whole book i know the which two sentences are important they'll do that i don't have time to read a book you have to just direct your gaze to it and here is example you direct gaze you say ah that's not my target i keep going go there or there. and a lot of observers and i say you need to find your uniquely oriented by as soon as possible. Don't be distracted by something, other things, okay? They say, yeah, I do exactly what you say. I say, but you get distracted, your eye moved the other way. I say, no, I swear to you, I follow your instruction. I never move that way. Then I have to show them their eye traces. Did I move that way? So it is so bottomed up, they did not even realize they did. Of course I knew because I, uh, so, so for people who are trained, they actually aware they move that way. But if you're naive and inexperienced, you may not even realize that you move that because you happen so quickly. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is yeah. Uh -huh. There's no. Uh, there is a biological preference. You can be uh, like a left hand dominant and a right hand dominant. Turns out that this happened regardless left or right eye. You can for the same person, you can sweep. No, not a problem. And maybe for computer vision, you would say you need to do segmentation without classification in a sense that, you know, you segment, you know, your image segmentation classification, yeah? Now, maybe you're all familiar with ETA, Koch, CDNC map, where they have the visual input comes in and then they divide into multiple feature maps and so on and so forth. But here, you don't divide it, you just all lump into V1, some V1 cell this way, that way. So this is more parsimonious and economic in terms of being fast. And I just all these neurons and just go there, yeah? So, but then you say, well, algorithmically, this will be okay. Why don't we just use that? But turns out that you can find, they give different predictions and then you can go test and you find the brain actually operate like this, yeah? And I will point out to them when it happens. So actually the V1 CNC hypothesis is more correct. So if you want to be a coarse approximation of CNC map, you can use Ethan Koch, which we call a phenomenological model of the reality. But if you want something more accurate, you may want to use this. Of course, to use this, you have to say, how, what are these V1 cells doing? And so on. So here is one particular prediction. You can say that it distinguishes between ET Koch, uh, ET CDC map and the, the V1. Here, let's say do texture segmentation. And texture segmentation in computer vision is one of the most difficult one, yeah? And so imagine, ah, oh, this pops out, no problem. The reason, you know, by the way, I only show a small part of the big image, yeah? And just so the small part, so they, they extend infinity to all directions. Well, this is the input, and you know, in V1, the border bars will evoke higher responses because cells tune to the same orientation, suppress each other, and the border bars, have, they have fewer neighbors, uh, iso orientation neighbors, that's no problem. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna just quick animate. And therefore, if you read out the saliency bidding for attention, they have the higher bid, so therefore attention go to the border. That's how you do the segmentation. Now imagine you have a checkerboard pattern of the horizontal vertical bars, and each of them also has half of the neighbors sharing the same orientation, just like these border bars. So therefore in V1, you will have responses just like these border bars, so higher than, than a non-border bar. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So therefore, they bid the same value to attention, so none of them are salient. Yeah, no problem. Now, if you superpose these two together, A and B to C, texture border, is it salient to you? Not salient, yeah? Because they evoke view on responses like that. So imagine this response is two, their response is one, here all response is two, so therefore two plus two will be equal to four. But if you take a maximum, oh, I didn't say two, it's 10 and five, and then all 10 and add it together like that. It's like that. So if you take maximum, that's exactly what the V1 bidding is. But if you take eating cork summation, and the border will be 20, it will be higher at the borders, yeah? So therefore, this shows that actually our brain does do the bidding like V1. V1 highest firing rate, who cares? They just do that. Okay, no location is salient. And that's why you cannot tell. So if you have filter banks, this is very obvious, yeah? So filter bank algorithm can find a border very quickly, but we humans don't do it that way, yeah? Can it be trained like if you see a million of these 
Uh, yeah, maybe not, because I was the person who got trained two years. I still couldn't do it better than that. Yeah, and uh, so the naive people, because I did this experiment, and, and then in the pilot experiment took a long time. Uh, so this I can do half a second. This is still 0 0.8 second. I can never reach that way. Yeah, difficult. Okay, and so this shows that it's it's actually maximum rule, not summation rule. I'm sorry, it's a bit. There's another way is to say, what if you want to find a uniquely odd one out bar, this red bar, very odd, okay? Let's say you can find it by reaction time of 500 millisecond, and let's say odd in orientation 600 millisecond. Turns out that you can predict what this is by the V1 CDNC hypothesis. You predict it by, oh, you predict it by, uh, so what's that reaction time, okay? 400 millisecond? 500 millisecond, what would you put in? Now let's try to be a scientist. You know this is 500, this is 600 order. Yeah? 400, why 400? You're trying to use summation rule. Remember, use maximum rule. Maximum rule, remember? But you want to take the maximum response, okay? So the idea is, imagine you have a V1, this 500, it must be because some neurons, okay. Let's say, yeah, sorry, it's a little, I've tried to rush in time a little bit there. Yeah. This 500 must be because a neuron tuned to color is firing some X, okay? It wants to say X value, 500. And this must be firing Y value, 600. Y must be smaller than X, right? Because the higher firing, shorter reaction time. So longer reaction time, Y must be smaller. But here you have X and Y. One neuron tuned to red color, another neuron tuned to origin, X and Y, which is bigger, must be X. X equal, for X firing, it must be 500. So they did 500. So you actually predict precisely 500 with no parameter, no cheating. You cannot tune any parameter. This is precisely predict 500. This is the minimum of these two. Okay, and then you can go measure it and see, is it really 500? If it's correct, your theory is correct. If it's wrong, then your theory is, uh, if it's correct, your theory is not yet correct. It's just not quite proven wrong, yeah? And so that's the idea. But of course, in reaction time, it's not always 500 because the neural response is stochastic. So therefore you actually have a distribution of reaction time. And similarly, this response is why you have a distribution reaction time. And what is that distribution? You can predict the whole distribution just by Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, you take a random sample in these two distribution, put into that and give it as a sample in here. You repeat many, many times, you can do the whole distribution. And then you can compare it with actually experimental data and see if the distribution fit. Not fit, match, because there's no parameter to fit. Yeah, that's what happens. And so, however, it turns out that real V1 has neuron tuned to conjunction of neuron. Uh, uh, remember, in efficient coding, we realize V1 some neuron tuned to both orientation and color. Then it's in trouble. If it's both orientation and color, then this equality does not hold. It will be less equal. Okay. So therefore, the actual reaction time should be slightly shorter. So that's what you predict, and then you go measure it. It turns out that was the case. Okay, so you can do it for orientation and color, you can do it for motion and uh, orientation. And that's both are less because in V1 we do have cells tuned to motion and orientation. But in V1 we have no cell tuned to both color and motion. Therefore, this should be equal. So V1 is peculiar. Okay, it has cell tuned both to color orientation, motion orientation, but no cell tuned to both, nothing. So this is equal. So this is a signature of V1. Can we find it? And you go do behavior measurement. You find if this is called race model. Okay, equal means race. You race these two reaction time, get that reaction time. Race model prediction. These should be faster than run multiple. This should be the same. And that's exactly what you, uh, but by the way, V2 will predict that because in V2, we do have these neuron tuned conjunction. And then a reaction time exactly as V1. And so therefore, you know that at least for this task, V1 alone is enough and V2 is not necessary, yeah? And so here we find there is a way for us to be very precise and falsifiable prediction to say, 
And then turns out that you can also combine these three features together, color, motion, and orientation. So therefore you can have neuron, you know, you can find a unique color, unique motion, unique orientation, and double feature unique orient, uh, color and motion direction, unique color and orientation and so on. And a triple, you know, these are double feature uh, and triple feature. And turns out that because V1 doesn't have cells tuned to all three features, you can derive a mathematical equation like that without a single parameter. That means you can use these to predict that. Okay, and then you can follow it and you find exactly as you predict. And you can statistically test it as statistically indifferent, predict it and observe on top of each other. And But if V2 is involved, then you would have to predict, uh, if V2 is, this will be less equal sign and this doesn't happen. And then recently we are also showing monkeys. So monkeys, they do, we do this experiment. We make monkey fix in the middle. Once they fix in the middle, we flash these two bar, these bars two groups by on screen and monkey's task is saccato uniquely only by as, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Is this the slide? Uh, yes, this one. Yeah. Because it was the one with all three. Yes. Yeah, but it turns out that once this is the uh, uh, derived uh, formula, yeah. And uh, so it turns out that this will you take all six kind of neurons. Neuron tuned to color only, motion only, and orientation only. Neuron tuned to color motion conjunctively, turns out there's none such things in V1, but this formula also includes that. With or without the neuron tuned to color orientation, neuron tuned to, so six neurons take their maximum, there will be salinity of that, you can derive. And so this equation, all it requires that V1 doesn't have these neurons. V1 can have all of these neurons or none of these neurons, doesn't matter. This equation holds. And there's not a single parameter you can tune, and that's how you you get that. And then turns out that in V2 you do have these neurons in V2. That's why V2 will predict a different curve. And the fact that we did not show what V2 predict it shows that this task only involves V1. After all, we want attentional selection, you need to want decoding. So if V2 is not involved, next lecture we'll talk about decoding. We need to select and then decode. So that will dictate what the visual algorithm is in the brain by knowing whether V2 is involved or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So that's the idea. And then we are finding monkeys. Monkey is supposed to find this bar uniquely go, and this bar could be here, there, anywhere. So monkey doesn't know. And then we measure, uh, because the monkey will take 200 milliseconds before they find and move their eye to it. So therefore you have 200 millisecond window to measure what's V1 responding is. Does that mean? Before they move their eye. Okay, and then you find that this is time and this is V1's response. Some of, some of the time this happened to be where you're measuring. Okay, and then you find that for trial that monkeys I go there faster, it responds high. Yeah, and uh, let's forget about this, okay. And this happens really early at about 40 to 50 milliseconds, it's already start to happen starting from onset. This is so early, there's no time for feedback. So this signal does not come from the top-down feedback from any other brain area. So this is a very strong kind of a support that this has to bottom up really happening. Yeah, and so that's that. And then we also have FMI data in showing that also support that. And then you say, oh, okay, very good. Shall we then do a, you know, just have some intuition. You can use a V1 recurrent model, kind of a more or less model onto the real uh, brain and trying to see what happens. But there's a philosophical idea. You say, oh, this cross is salient, yeah? But in V1, there is another single neuron tuned to cross, right? V1 neuron only tuned to orientations. Well, you don't need the V1 neuron tune to cross. All you need is the horizontal bar is activated, yeah? So the idea is you don't have to recognize that's a tiger before I move my eye to it. You don't have to recognize it's a cross before you move it. The whole idea is you, you do the segmentation before you classify it, and V1 can do it. So V1 is very stupid, but very fast. 
that show uh, does exactly what you need. Yeah, that's the idea. And uh, so that's why, you know, yeah. So the cross, no need to recognize this cross for it to attract your attention. That's the idea. Okay. And uh, um, and then, then you can put this V1 model to lots of complex situations, like in a, in a circle around noise, and these are complex. Uh, yeah, here is a complex texture with 45 minus 45 degree bars. Here is another spatial arrangement 45, but here's a border. This is the highest V1 response. This is where translation invariance break down, something physicists like, yeah? They say, you know, there is a statistical difference between this region and that region in a, in a second and higher order statistics, but not, not in the zeros, uh, first order statistics. And V1 can get that. Same thing here, you know, these kind of things, yeah? And so therefore this way we can get some intuition of what's going on, you know, weaker, yeah. But anyway, then the idea is, um, yeah, we, we uh, so then we are ready to say if selection happens in V1, um, what um, should we should the decoding do in light of it? Yeah. And today uh, this lecture stops at 12 o'clock. So we have a uh, okay, this is yeah, anyway, that's it. That will be the next lecture. I kind of tried to sell so, so quickly and I have more spare time. Yeah, so if you like to uh let me know that which bit I went too quickly or just questions. Yeah, please uh, let me ask now. Yes. Uh, it's recurrent in terms of uh, the, the features. Uh, you notice that. Um, Uh, that's so here is a patch of v1 okay and uh, so 200 this 500 millis, millimeters so this is about two or three millimeters by two or three millimeters so v1 is roughly about four centimeters by three centimeters so it's like quite a cast size yeah so this is a very small patch of V1, okay? And here is a, uh, this is the, people inject some kind of a visualization dyes around here. Oh, by the way, these colors just means V1 neurons are clustered according to their preferred orientation. This is just visualization of underlying orientation. So blue means they're for red, uh, uh, vertical preferred orientation and red, means horizontal preferred orientation. And so if you inject some dyes here near blue region, so these neurons prefer vertical orientation, and you find that these are axons projecting from this region, they all go for a distance between two to four millimeters. Okay, two to four millimeters. So, hmm, remember the V1 is about four centimeters, it's two to four millimeters. So therefore you can say the connection is roughly about 5% to 10% of the visual field. So it's local connections in V1. But unfortunately, V1 is not retinotopically uniform visual field, but this is really cost magnitude for estimation. Yeah. Recurrent to it, the idea is these neurons are projecting to other neurons territory. Yeah, so therefore, you know, th this bar and that bar, they may suppress each other, but their rest of your location are just nearby. And they are they have a recurrent connection interacting with another neuron. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so these anatomical connections are there, and people can stick an electrode to the core from this neuron, stick an electrode to the core from this neuron, and see if by activating this neuron, this neuron is suppressed or not. They do find suppression. And then they say, what if I go somewhere else from this and it doesn't, doesn't have suppression? And if I go too far away, it doesn't reach well, you know, see I mean? so they see how far I reach. They want to see the so recurrent network is a local network or all to all connected network, or do they have a selectivity in the connection? Looks like a, indeed, because only neurons tuned to vertical are more likely to be connected, but they, it does not project to these red patches or yellow patches. So 
to other neuron, the neurons not tuned to vertical, it does not project to. So this shows the anatomical basis for this recurrent connection and shows that you can do these computations. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. So, so just to see if I'm understanding, so it's like the white dots are projecting out to the, all the black dots? That's right, white dots is where, you know, biology, when you inject something, then you, you, you make a mark there, this is where I inject. So, so for instance, you can inject dyes into cells, and then the cells active transformation will translate this dye all the way to the end of the exon. And these end exon things are the black stuff. And then you know where the cell body is and then where the exon goes and how far it goes. Yeah. It seems like you pointed out that the, the black dots tend to focus on the same, the blue or- That's right, yeah. But it also seems like they're following a path, like a trajectory, like they're all going- That's right, yeah. It turns out that uh, uh, this is actually not the right image, yeah. Turns out that they, they tend to follow trajectory of their preferred orientation. So, so they're trying to do collinear lining up. Remember one of the, yeah, no, this is collinear thing. Yeah, they're trying to line up. So it turns out that uh, I kind of trying to skip detail. It's not all suppression. There's also facilitation. And this facilitation is contract determinant because you have a sigmoid function of the things. So you have excitation and inhibition. Imagine excitation and inhibition depend on where you are on your sigmoid curve, yeah? So the sigma was in a steeper part of curve or shallow bit of curve. If you are in a shallow bit of curve, you can have collinear facilitation. If you're steeper, it's more of a like-to-like -like suppression. So when I'm explaining to you the like-to-like -like suppression, it actually is a steeper part of curve where uh, image is not too deep. And then you can say all these subtle details, you can dig in and see whether it does happen in behavior. And that's another way of testing whether uh, your salience analysis is correct. And so today I'm just highlighting the most uh, biggest obvious things, but those details can give you further opportunities to, because after all you say, I'm going to do my vision algorithm depending on this very oh, uh, wild hypothesis. What if this hypothesis is wrong? Yeah, okay, where is it? And then you, you don't want to commit yourself. So therefore, the reason I spend so much time to talk about this is that, wait a minute, you say selection starting in V1, that's, what if it's a completely wrong, then we're gonna be led in the wrong way. So therefore it is so very important to, to realize it is wrong or not. So therefore this is all this, to, 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 uh, particularly you say, okay, yeah, um, you know, by the time you predict this, you say, wait a minute, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, when I predicted this, I just realized this is the end of the hypothesis, that's it, because uh, this is just impossible, yeah. But when it's impossible, prediction, this is actually an opportunity to falsify a hypothesis. And if it's falsified, then we don't go down this road. We say, no, it can't be this way, yeah. But, you know, this also shows that we are kind of trying to use our own brain to study our brain. We are using our intuitions, but our intuition mostly top down, yeah? But so much of the computation in our brain is completely hidden from us. And so therefore we are not kind of studying our brain objectively. And we have to be surprised by these things to realize, oh my God, you know, we are so uh, studying our brain in our very subjective feeling of how the brain algorithm should be. Until, uh, you know, we look at this and say, okay, yeah. Yeah, so in a sense that it's not as if we're studying some kind of a uh, something, you know, a protein structure where we, we can be objectively look at the protein structure and see what it is. This we are thinking using already very biased, for instance, we think we can see the whole field clearly, yeah? Until we remind ourselves, no, we can't see the whole field clearly, yeah? Well, in a sense that we are arriving at a self-consistent solution, well, I don't see it, but, but if this is unknown unknown, if it's unknown unknown, it does not falsify our idea, then we get to the next. And so therefore with this unknown unknowns, and they're trying to understand what is the visual algorithm in the brain is one of the fun and challenge things to understand the brain. Yeah, just to discover that. Yes. 
Oh, are they, are they valid birds? No, they are not. So, for instance, you can look at these pop out situations, you know, such as unique orientation, unique color pop out. Uh, they don't happen in children until, I don't know, four or five months or something. Yeah, it takes a while. Yeah. And of course, you can say children haven't even recognized their mother until six or seven months. Yeah, it takes a while. Sorry, you say they don't recognize their mother for six or seven months? Six or seven months. Yeah, so uh, they don't recognize the face very well, but later on they realize the face, but they cannot really tell the details of a face. You notice babies around six or seven or eight months, they start to have anxiety of not wanting to be with strangers because by then they start to recognize their mother or not that. But before that, they smile to everybody. They're such a cute baby, they smile to everybody. But then, because they could not tell the difference, maybe they can tell the smell. So you may have a smell, but if it's not smell just by sight, they could not tell too well. Of course, you, they can tell the big things like, you know, strong hairline or mustache, but detail they may not be able. They may be able to tell your race or white or black, you know, but uh, detail they cannot tell. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I really want to know this kind of a data. I really want to know how reliable. So I do not know. And so often, you know, when you when you when you new parents, you act like a child. I don't know that you often have to make your work with my dad. You know, my dad is sitting on the table. <laughs> Very good question. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like a couple slides down, but when you had the example where the textures had the same first order statistics, but it was only higher order statistics, I couldn't understand how the V1 was able to, to still spot the order. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, uh, yeah, we kind of understand this situation more easily, yeah? So let's try to work it out. Yeah, indeed, how does V1 do that? So sometimes it's really subtle. Where is it? Okay, yeah. Okay, so look at one of these border bars, let's say. Let's look at this bar. Okay, let me zoom it up. Oh, maybe it'll be bigger. Okay, this bar. It has two left and right flankers, obviously, suppressing it. But he is collinear facilitation. But if you look at these inside bars, they have a left and right flankers, but no collinear facilitation. A little bit subtle difference, yeah? Yeah. So. Yeah. But then this bar is not so, because this has, oh, no. This bar has top and bottom flankers, and this one has no corneal facilitation. Yeah, and so therefore you can see these, these can be quite subtle. So therefore it's not a strong pop out compared to, where, where did it go? Okay. Oh, so you see that, oh, it's these ones. Yeah, it's these ones. Well, how come it's these ones? No, now nah, I'm kind of invalidating myself, huh? Because these are the highest one, what are they? Okay. Um, how come it's this one? So let's understand why these one the highest one. Okay. Ah, these ones they they have suppression only from the left label, not right label. Do you see? Okay, let's expand it. 
So because expression is always the strongest one. So uh, let's zoom it up. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, where did it go? Okay, here. Oh. No, I'm sorry. Where did it go? Oh. Which one is that? Which one? Oh, this one. Okay, so let's zoom it in. Okay. So remember, we say it's just these ones. So therefore, it's it's this this bar. Okay, this bar is suppressed by the left neighbor, but not right neighbor, not top neighbor, not bottom neighbor. Even though it doesn't have collinear facilitation. See what I mean? So therefore. Because remember, suppression is stronger than the facilitation, and facilitation only works for the weaker. Yeah, and so therefore, we find that it's it's these bars the highest. So once the, those bars. Oh, I see. Only the every, only the ones that are. Yeah, this uh, one. Yeah. Uh, so somehow, you know, because remember, the V one's interaction is in local recurrent network, and this recurrent interaction is translation in the left. We ignore the input would be a sampling of some of the And this transition invariant some uh, interaction with transition invariant input contrast. There, where it will break is where your transition invariant input breaks. Then at this location, it could amplify. So V1 is obviously evolved, has evolved such a circuit to detect where transition invariant input breaks, but not all the time. Okay, because remember we had an example where the summation, so so therefore you can find where it doesn't work and where it does work, and see where it doesn't work. It also happen to be where in psychology you cannot just uh, pop out. And then you say, ah, you know, it's not perfect, but somehow the brain uses it because whatever you understand that it wouldn't work, indeed it doesn't work. Yeah, such as. Uh, he is an example of failure where the statistics, are even the second order, already went very badly. But somehow, V1's uh, translation invariant uh, technology did not detect. Yeah. And so it, it has the weakness just as you expect. Yeah. Okay. Um, Is it a bit like what? So for instance, psychology experiments show that we cannot pay attention at two locations at the same time. But if we want to uh, eye movement going that way, this neuron A make eye movement going that way, and neuron B make eye movement going that way. That if you stimulate neuron A and B together, then you go in the middle. That's only for eye movement. And people have done experiments say, can we pay attention to this and that at the same time? You cannot. Yeah. You can consciously or unconsciously. Remember, you have bottom up and top down. Yeah, and just like you know, in the experiment we show, you have to go find a unique only bar, but unconsciously you go to the uniquely I. It's, this is a bottom up. It's like a, it's like your V1 is so automatic. It just make you do it to save your life. Yeah, it just does it. Now, sometimes for instance, you, you're, of course, this is not exactly a spinal circuit, but sometimes you can have your spinal circuit, you know, when you're doing tennis or doing something, you just realize how come my head, leg moves so quickly. It's like, a, it must be some really short circuit thing that help you. Yeah, but you need a lot of practice. Yeah, I need a lot of skill practice. Then you do it. It's like, gosh, if I think I cannot act so fast, you have to have something in your brain that doesn't need. Oh, if you define thinking as top down, you must have lots of bottom up thinking. Use your spinal cord, use your V1. And in vision, you use your V1 and retina. And in fish, retina already does a lot. It's super crucial. In humans, somehow primates, we put it on V1, and V1 is so huge. Yeah, it is. Uh, remember, we say the brain is very expensive. Um, the brain has. Where is the, where is my image of the brain? The brain is uses using. Uh, yeah, the brain uses. 
25% of our metabolic energy. Yeah. Or do I have a brain somewhere? Yeah, uh, but, and V1 is 25% of the whole visual cortex. The visual cortex is 50% of the whole monkey's brain. So you say V1 is a very, here is the, I'll show you how big V1 is. This is monkey's brain, yeah? So I saw the monkey's brain. So monkey's brain often used as, a, so, so this is the monkey's brain. You open it up, unfold, okay? The colored region is exclusively for vision. The non-colored region can be for hearing, motion, memory, many other things. Huh? And so therefore, the monkey's brain spends 50% on vision. So that's monkeys and we humans are very visual animals. A mouse may not be so. Three blind mice, you hear about the sound. And they are blind, but they smell and smell. But in this visual cortex, you see V1 is occupying 25%. Very, very expensive, yeah? And so if we spend 20 to 25% of our metabolic energy on the brain, and then 12% of it is on V1, it must be very worth it. Otherwise, the brain wouldn't do it because we must have optimized the energy budget for our brain to do it that way. And so therefore, the question is for us as computational people say, what is this expensive graphics card doing? And to, to think that it is actually doing the selection without recognition, you will, if philosophically you think it must be by one of the expensive part of the brain. But this is, must be is a very soft way. You know? It's not a proof. It's just a motivation, like a consistent. To prove we have to do this reaction time experiment or you know, predict exactly where it is to it's not even proof, it's just to falsify, to confirm, because and maybe, you know, next year you prove it wrong, then hopefully this become a stepping stone for something even more correct. That's the hope. Because otherwise, you know, it's not very easy for us to keep on just circling around. Um, maybe some of you haven't come to the first lecture where the motivation comes in as, uh, because uh, in vision we have made lots of progress to V1, more than 50 years ago and then the progress stalled and then you say whose fault is it it's actually we theorists fault because if you ask the wrong question to do one experiment versus another is actually a theoretical question theoretical question which experiment to do so if you ask the wrong question you are barking up the wrong tree and then that, that may be the reason and so therefore we have to come back to our drawing board and think what is vision uh, in a sense that if we are three, if we are like a blind people touching the elephant, if you, if we know if we know it's an elephant, then it's easier for us to touch. Oh, there must be a trunk, there must be a you know tusk and so on. But if we didn't know it's an elephant, we may be doing the wrong experiment. Yeah. So if we think it's a tree, then you say, oh, very good. This looks like a tree bark, and a tree bark there is some bugs in it, and maybe we should you know sequence the DNA, see what are the flea in the bug, and then you did not realize it's an elephant, then you go the wrong way. So the idea is, so the motivation is, do we really want to start this new framework at all? Yeah, uh, if this is the new framework, you know, you know, the motivation was because the traditional framework is making us not making progress for half a century. Then I say, okay, can we ask a new question? So when you ask a new question, you kind of want to put a little more strict uh, criteria on yourself we don't want to spend another 50 years before we realize it's wrong and so that's why kind of in a sense that uh, is it really in a selection attention studying v1 or v2 or selection into v4 then the algorithm will be very different and so therefore we don't want to jump in just because it's a fancy idea but maybe it's a wrong idea yeah fancy idea could be a wrong idea so not only is a fancy idea but also see whether it's a correct idea and then we think okay if selection segmentation is starting before classification versus segmentation starting after classification, then the vision algorithm will be very different. And then we uh, later on after the lunch, we're going to start at two o'clock. We think about fee forward feedback mechanisms and what does that mean by central vision versus peripheral vision? And so you re re rethink the algorithm and then discover that oh, we still don't know so many things there in order. But just to discover where well, we don't know this and we need to know them is already better than don't even know what we don't know, you see what I mean? So in a sense that if we make uh, unknown unknowns become known unknowns, then go answer the question. That's the hope. 
because otherwise uh, it will just another yeah that's that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 